Good to go. Cool. Hey, it's October and this is IGDA. No, sorry. Not going to do that cheesy thing. Hey, uh, hi, I'm Brian Gerhards. I'm here with the IGDA Des Moines chapter. Uh, we got a wonderful presentation for you today, John Franco uh, Berardi. And uh, if I if I mispronounce your name, please do call me out. <laughs> uh, oh yes, no, I've known uh, I've known John Franco for uh, for a number of years now, and it's uh, it's always a pleasure to have him around. Uh, real quick, let's talk about the uh, your Des Moines chapter. So IGDA chapter uh, here in Des Moines. Uh, we are here to help promote uh, game development, not only from hobby, but also from professional. And anybody who is in the hobby that wants to get into professional, we're here to support you. Um, as part of uh, it, everything that you can see on there, our goal is to connect and support local game designers, developers, artists, et cetera. So we're not only here for the development, we're here for everything. And uh, any IGDA presentations, just to throw a little uh, pitch in here that you would like to see, um, please do hop on our Discord. Please do hop on our Slack. Uh, get a conversation going and just let us know. Post it anywhere. We'll we'll find it on channel. We'll get it out to you. Um, but yeah, as, as I said, on there also, stay connected. Check out our Facebook. Uh, we have a Facebook page. We have a Facebook group. Uh, we have a Twitter page. Uh, and there's our Slack and Discord. Uh, let's see. Uh, it, also, if you're interested, uh, IGDA does have a wonderful uh, membership program that is available. Uh, for purchase, it's a yearly membership. Uh, by purchasing the membership, uh, it does have a little bit of a throwback to your local chapter. Uh, as part of this, you can get additional knowledge and such for game development. Again, in all the areas uh, that we uh, we definitely support, looking at expert resource library, as it says on there, special interest groups, uh, lots of other resources for you. Uh, great community, wonderful advocacy, uh, plenty of discounts. If you're a Unity person, go get yourself a Unity discount, uh, which I believe actually saves you more money than this costs. So anyways, um, and it also, uh, as part of your membership, it does go towards supporting uh, other areas and other um, support groups that, uh, I don't want to say Unity, that IGDA does help out with. So take a look at that, um, at that link if you're interested. Um, but otherwise, uh, let's go ahead and move this forward. So as I said before, we have Gianfranco uh, Berardi and uh, here to talk to you today. So I'll go ahead and hand the mic over. Hi, everyone. As Brian said, my name is Gianfranco Berardi. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the owner of GB Games LLC. I'm a very, very part-time indie game developer currently, uh, and I have a day job. And so... Uh, if you're here for how game development made me a better software developer and vice versa, you're in the right place. So I'm ready uh, to get going. The uh, reason why you're here, uh, you can be here for any number of reasons, but uh, one might be that you're also a very part-time indie game developer with a day job uh, with aspirations to become a full-time indie or a full-time indie who just needs more steady income. Uh, and you wanna figure out how to make the most of that for yourselves. Um, a lot of this talk is going to be about transferable skills. Uh, and so to kind of introduce this, I'm gonna hand this over to Jason Alba, who's a author on Pluralsight. Pluralsight being a, a website where you can go and learn uh, various things related to technology, um, a lot of software development, uh, usually technology things, but the, he's got a course out there called Building and Managing Your Career Plan. And in that, he has a, a module about the keys to career success. And one of the things he highlights is just learning to communicate your transferable skills. Um, the main idea behind this is that sometimes what you need to know for the job isn't something you have exactly a match for, uh, but you have a different experience that's kind of close. In a separate module, he basically says, this is especially important uh, to be able to communicate this uh, when you don't have the exact experience someone's looking for. Um, so as an example of this, uh, years ago, I remember running into a person at a party. Uh, he used to work for Midway Games. Uh, they had a mass layoff just before, I think, and uh, so he needed a job. There was a financial trading firm in town. This is in Chicago. And 
one of the things they need is very, very fast transactions. Uh, time is money. If you can make a trade faster than your competition, then you're going to be the one that's more valuable. So they needed people who can optimize uh, transactions. And this person was the one who optimized frame rates for the games that Midway made. I remember him kind of laughing at how uh, the amount of skill needed was less than what he needed at the game uh, on the game side. But because he was able to demonstrate that he could do that kind of work, he got the job. Um, we already talked about that. There we go. So I'm going to very quickly, uh, and, and I'll try to be brief, uh, talk a bit about my career in, in terms of software development uh, and, and, and game development. And it'll all make sense as I talk about how they worked hand in hand. Um, so I would say back in the 80s, uh, at some point, my parents, I was very privileged to be able to have an Apple 2C Plus in my home. Uh, I remember my mom uh, being the first programmer that I met because she took some classes at the community college and then showed me some cool things like making uh, a looping program that printed my name a bunch of times. So then I tried writing the kind of similar code. Eventually, I figured out that you can actually do graphics mode and then specifically high res mode. And when I saw what I could do in high res mode, I recognized it as very similar to the games that I was playing on Apple IIZ Plus. So I thought I could make games. Um, so my first attempts were usually like, I was gonna try and make a Pac-Man clone. Uh, I even tried making some text-based RPGs with illustrations. I ran into memory limits without realizing what was going on. Just I just knew my code got corrupted. Uh, my first actual game is Lost to the Ages, uh, but it was a game I called Capture the Flag. It had a grid. There was a bunch of a few couple of stick figures. It was a two-player game, and you made choices to move around trying to find your opponent's flag before they did. And it was a good time. Uh, in the 90s, I discovered QBasic. Uh, so in, on the Apple IIc Plus, I was using AppleSoft Basic. Uh, QBasic was kind of the step up. It was fantastic. And I decided to try to make a Pac-Man clone again. And uh, again, kind of self-taught, didn't have a, a formal education at all at this point um, related to coding. Uh, so a lot of my code was a mess. I've actually looked at it just the other day. It is still a mess. I actually used GoTo uh, in it a lot. That's something that's a big sin in software development. But there were bouncing cherries. The ghosts actually, when you ate them, they returned back to home and then you know put their costume back on and came back after you. Um, and at some point, I got on the internet. And uh, so this game came out in 19, or I, I finished it in 1998. And I got on the internet a couple years later um, and found out that there was an entire QBasic subculture out there. And I, like web forums and review sites, and I started posting the game everywhere. Um, and on Pete's QBasic site, I'm very proud to say that I got my first game review for a game I made. Uh, I got a 70%, and that review is still online, uh, which is interesting. Uh, as a basic programmer, apparently I learned that Dijkstra, one of the big names in computer science back in the day, uh, probably thinks that I am uh, ir you know, unable to be uh, redeemed, um, but that's okay. I hope I've proven him wrong. Uh, so fast forward a little bit, late 90s, early 2000s, I was in college, I was going to computer science school, and, you know, apparently you can't do much with basics, so I was trying to learn C++. The language that was officially taught at the school was C++, but apparently the professors were all new to it. Uh, they were used to teaching C before that. C++ had some differences that they all weren't um, on top of, so they didn't really teach it well. And I just remember it feeling like, well, QBasic was fun. C++ is less fun and still wanting to know how to get it to work. But eventually I found out that the way I was taught C++ was wrong, which was frustrating because that was years of <laughs> time that I lost, like not working on fun things. Um, around 2004, I was at an indie game developer meetup. It was in Schaumburg because nothing in Chicago is ever actually in Chicago. And I remember it was at a Starbucks. Uh, I was about to leave the meeting at the end of the night and I was still kind of frustrated about my programming um, skills. And I said, how do I get better at programming? And I just remember a few of the people there looking at each other. Some of these people had made, uh, they have their own casual game portals, if you remember what those are. 
Uh, they, they had multiple games under their belts. They were, some of them were very successful doing it full time. And they just kind of looked at each other and looked at me and then said, just, just do it. Which is not like the best advice I was looking for, uh, but it turned out it was probably the best advice I needed. I just didn't realize it at the time. So back to the tail end of my college career, uh, I started reteaching myself. I can't remember how, I was probably on a gamedev.net forum post or something where someone mentioned a C++ book and I started reading that one and everything started clicking. Uh, things that seemed advanced that I was looking at online suddenly were like, oh, these are just basic concepts and I just was taught wrong. So I started relearning, I did my own things. And, uh, and again, C++ was a lot more fun. And at some point I started actually making games again. I made some command line things, um, tic-tac-toe specifically. I made a, a command line Monopoly game specifically for a job interview that was the coding test. And uh, I'll talk about the job I got from that later. But in 2005, I participated in my first game jam. It was a 24 hour game jam called Game in a Day. It was in June and the, I can't remember if there was a theme for it, but the, I think it was Fusion if there was, but uh, this was the first time I've experienced what people call uh, imposter syndrome, where partway through this game jam, I suddenly had this very uh, terrible fear, just like this, this welling up within me of just like, oh, I don't even know if I should do this anymore. Uh, like I was worried that I was out of my depth. And it, I just remember logically thinking, okay, but if I just do it, then I'm fine. Uh, but the, the, the general sense was like, oh no, this is awful. Um, I remember in the IRC chat or whatever it was, there was somebody who, when they heard what I wanted to do to make, uh, for, to make in 24 hours, he warned me that I was, I was doing too much, that I need to scale down my scope. Uh, it turned out he was right. I had a whole cool concept I can tell you all about later. Uh, but what I ended up doing was making this game. You can kind of see this little screenshot here. Little alien dude, he shoots these uh, green fuzzy guys who uh, every so often they split apart and split into two. So after a while, if you don't, if you don't get rid of them, they, they start overwhelming you. Um, so I was pretty proud of this 24 hour game that I made, even if it wasn't the game that I wanted to make. Uh, my first day job was WMS. It was a Chicago based company. They made slot machines. Uh, WMS used to be Williams and they used to make pinball games. Uh, if you remember the, the classic game Defender, that was also theirs, uh, but they were making slot machines. And uh, my first project was called the Village People Party. I remember the producer asking me, do you like the village people? And I said, I don't hate them. And he says, you will. And he was right because after that project, I couldn't go to weddings for a long time uh, just to get away from the music. But working on that project, everything was fine for months. And then suddenly we were a month away from a deadline and everybody suddenly was not okay with the progress of the project. And at some point I was warned about my poor performance and it was a miserable time. I'll tell you more about that miserable time later in this presentation. Uh, fast forward a bit, things were better. Uh, 2008 was my first Ludum Dare. It was the 11th Ludum Dare. The theme was minimalist. I think I called my game minimalist um, and I just kept it simple. I, I had a mouse, I had collision boxes and, uh, and that was it. And I got it done. I even had sound effects. That was fantastic. Um, at some point I even had a flash version of this made and had it on my website for a long time. I worked with somebody and it was like an exercise in outsourcing where I managed to port the game to Facebook and make a uh, sea friends theme. Uh, I love the art for it. And, uh, someone at some point even did a horror themed remake of my Ludum Dare uh, game. And I thought that was pretty cool to see. Um, and since then I participated in multiple Ludum Dare's. I actually hosted the mini, I think number 20 was mine. Um, my theme for that was that most of the time in, in software development, you can do um, multiple, like basically if you have one object, you can make many clones of it easily in, in software. And I, I insisted that if you have anything, it has to be by itself. There can never be multiple versions of it, uh, which was a fun constraint. Uh, number 18 is bolded for a reason. I'll get to that later. 
but there was a few other game jams I, I participated in. Meaningful gameplay game jam was uh, a fun time here. Um, I think it was up in Ames and, or it might've been in Des Moines. And there was a few non-jam projects in my under my belt as well. Um, so by 2010, I quit my job. Uh, by this point, uh, even a year, or I think even less than a year after that I was told I was a poor performer, uh, my, my performance reviews were way better to the point where I think the, like one of the vice presidents asked my tech lead, like, is this, are these numbers right? And it's like, yeah, he's doing great. Um, so I was actually doing thriving at the job. Uh, I was actually part of an agile pilot project. This is the game that I last worked on. Um, the company was, they, they had the Monopoly license and they threw Monopoly on all sorts of games. And it's literally at one point they're like, well, the only thing we haven't done is Monopoly in space. And so here it is. Uh, and that was a fun project. Uh, but I quit and wanted to run my own business. Um, I wanted to do my, my own game development business full time. Uh, Ludum Dara number 18, the theme was enemies as weapons. And I had this game I called Stop That Hero. It was a basically uh, the way it got described to me and the way I started describing to other people because I thought, okay, that's probably accurate, is it's a reverse tower defense. But the idea is that you're the villain and you're trying to stop the good guys from taking over your castle. And um, so I worked on this. And what I thought was I did the Ludum Dare version of this in 48 hours. Uh, I could probably get this full version done in a month and sell it. And I was underestimating a lot of things here. Um, I took way too long making it. I hardly had any money uh, at the end. I was basically, up until this point, I was always making money. And uh, when I went full-time indie, I had no cash flow coming in. And it, so it turned out, you know, running a game development business was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. I thought I had enough runway. I did not. Uh, I thought I, I knew what I was going to be doing. I did not. I did underestimated just how uh, frustrating it is to see so many other indies succeeding during this time. And then I compared myself to them and I was really, um, really, really freaking out. I had analysis paralysis because I didn't really have a good sense of which direction I was going. And in the end, uh, the game kind of, I, I got it published, but it was in a very poor uh, situation compared to what you would find like on anywhere else. I think around that time, Kingdom Rush came out and Kingdom Rush was kind of like a much more polished, you know, really great game compared to what I had put out. So uh, in 2012, I was back on what I call corporate welfare. Uh, and it was kind of helpful in the sense that I had run out of money, uh, but having a day job, I was able to breathe again and figure out where I went wrong. I've done other talks about that. Um, so ask me about that if you'd like later. Um, but since then I've been on corporate welfare. I was at five years at John Deere uh, Intelligent Solutions Group. Uh, I've been four years at my current day job, uh, which used to be called Pillar, get it? Uh, these are the pictures I posted on Facebook to let my family know that I got a job, um, just in case you're wondering. But I'm, I'm at this point still plotting my return to full-time indie game development. So with all that said, uh, I went from almost getting fired from my first software development job uh, to suddenly being seen as a highly valuable member of the software development team. and. Uh, what I credit my success for that is my experience doing indie game development, especially that stint where I was running my business full time because I gained a lot of insight into what that takes. Uh, I say success in indie game development and I, I probably maybe should quote, quote, quotes around that, but I will say that uh, what I do well there, I definitely can credit some of the experience I got from my day job, the people I've talked with, uh, the things I've done. Um, to, to show me how I could do things better um, and has helped me with actually delivering on software or uh, on games that I, I've taken on as a project. So that was hopefully a very brief version of, of my career. Um, there's a lot more, but uh, I do wanna talk about some of the things that I found helped in terms of overlap between my game development uh, experience and my software development day job experience. So to start with, I wanna talk about high quality from start to finish. Uh, many years ago, uh, someone introduced me to the Dexterity Software Forums. It was a game developer, uh, Steve Pavlina, 
who had Dexterity Software. He made games. He created a forum. A lot of independent independent game developers uh, joined that forum to kind of talk about indie game development from a ver more pro stance rather than how do you make a game stance. And uh, if you're not familiar with Steve Pavlina, he was a soft uh, game developer, and eventually now he's a personal development guru. Uh, the Escapist had an article back in 2007 called the Indie Guru, where they basically talked about how Steve Pavlina was the catalyst and inspiration for a lot of indie game developers. And oh, wouldn't you know, my name is actually in that article. I forgot about this. I, I was interviewed for this at some point. Um, and this was around the time where I think I was, uh, I officially formed my own company and, uh, and I'm gonna start working on my first commercial game and such. And so I, I also was crediting Steve. Now Steve wrote this article called Zero Defect Software Planning which you can still find on gamedev.net and a few other places. Uh, and to, to kind of talk about what it is, it's not saying that you have no bugs, uh, but the idea is that you're focused on quality throughout development. So it's not something that you throw over the wall to your tester and say, okay, I, I finished working on everything. Now you tell me if you find any bugs and I'll fix them. Uh, that's, that's the wrong way to approach things. A uh, big key, though, is to have uh, goals at the beginning about what it is you want the game to have. So uh, when we talk about defects, it's not just, oh, there was a software bug that made it crash. Uh, it could also be that this game was supposed to be fast paced, but this scene or this section is not. It's part of why I'm not a big fan of Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, and maybe I haven't given Sonic the Hedgehog enough of a chance, but I feel like the whole point of the game is you're supposed to be super fast. And then every so often you run into something and you stop. And it just feels like it's counterintuitive to me. But obviously that doesn't mean anything. There's a lot of people who love Sonic. Uh, but at the same time, like if I was gonna make a game and my goal was to make it fast, I would try to eliminate anything that would slow you down uh, as much as I could. But uh, the main thing about zero defect software planning is the idea that uh, by focusing on quality throughout development, you actually spend less time debugging, you spend less time fixing things, and you end up getting projects done faster. So I'm gonna go back in time to, uh, actually I'm trying to remember what year, uh, but W. Edwards Deming, who was born in Iowa, which I didn't realize until I was preparing this presentation, uh, huge name, especially in Japan, uh, after World War II, he was instrumental in helping uh, Japanese industry get back on its feet and become super competitive on the world stage. Uh, total quality management is this concept that a lot of people credit some of a lot of his ideas to to what that means, even if it's not clear what total quality management exactly means. But basically, he focused on quality as uh, as, as a culture. Um, that you can't just put something together and throw it over the wall and, and see what happens. That quality needs to be part of the, the whole culture of the organization, not just the development uh, people, but everyone. And quality is defined by your customer's requirements. So it's not just made up or, or things like that. Uh, and management was definitely key to this. So a lot of the time when people call him in and ask him to talk about quality, he ends up talking about management, which always throws them off. Um, and the main focus was like, if you focus on quality, then the quality will go up and your costs will go down. So there's all sorts of virtual cycles in this. Um, why is it going backwards? There we go. Fast forward to the 90s. Uh, we have the Manifesto for Agile Software Development, uh, which if you're not familiar with, the idea behind this manifesto is that they, the number of software developers came together and said, how do we do software development better? This was a response to bad management uh, how, how projects often failed or went late. And it's like, okay, what can we do better? And there was a number of great concepts come out of it. But the principle that applies here is this continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. And so even then there is a lot of focus on like, okay, so let's make sure we do things well so that way we can do things fast. Um, so the main lesson that comes out of all of this uh, both in game development and in industry and in software development is that you build quality in from the beginning. Um, there's this idea that the cost of finding defects goes up as the defect lives. So if you introduce a defect in your design stage, you can easily fix it and it's gone. Uh, but if you let it go all the way to development, 
right? Like, let's say you come up with a design and it's counterintuitive and awful, but you built it anyway, which I have done at uh, my day job before. Uh, it then takes 10 times the effort to fix that, uh, which in this case, I, I can tell you when I was uh, one of my day jobs, we had a feature to work on. Uh, I remember a number of us saying this feels counterintuitive and it's like, well, we were told to do this by the UX people. We built it anyway. And then months later, we got feedback from customers who said it was confusing. And then we ended up having to do a bunch of rework to, to address that confusion. But if, so that got into production and it can take a hundred times or more effort um, in order to fix that. So you can imagine just letting a, de a defect fester, it gets expensive. So fix them as soon as you see them. Uh, one way to prevent defects from escaping is by having a regression test suite, uh, having tests in general automated as much as you can. Uh, every time you build your, your project, run it, run the tests. And then in terms of games, especially uh, play test, as early as you can. I've seen some advice out there that says if you're playtesting, um, you know, think about releasing it to playtesters. Get it out sooner than you think it's it's ready, and it'll pay off in dividends. So the next part is uh, the idea behind a project focus or a product focus. Uh, for my personal example, for game development back in 2005 uh, or 2006, I was once again like just just a baby in terms of doing game development and, and uh, programming, even if I have that 98 uh, game under my belt. I think that gave me overconfidence in terms of how easy it is to make a game, uh, to make that QBasic Pac-Man game. And I wanted to make this game at the time, I believe it was called Oracle's Eye, or at least that's the code name for it. I never came up with a different name for it. But I, I was building it up from scratch. I didn't have a game engine. And then every time I learned about some cool technique or, or something, I was like, oh, I got to learn how to make that. And I never actually had a game. It was kind of like, I'll just throw things together until I make it into a game. And that did not work very well. I ended up not making a game. I wanted to submit the game to the Indie Games Fest, and that did not happen. Uh, I was putting in the time, though. I was definitely putting in the effort. And things were eventually getting coded up, but nothing ever came together. And so that project stunk, basically. I'll fast forward a decade later, and uh, there was a thing called One Game a Month for a while. And for, I believe it was in the November 2013 month, I created a game. Um, it was basically a leaf raking physics simulation. And I thought, okay, well, I'll, I can make a more fleshed out version of this. So in 2015, uh, I think last, last meeting, someone asked me if I created game design documents and here's proof that I, I have done that in the past. Um, I wanted to make a, an Android game. My goal was to kind of figure out like, okay, what, like how, what kind of audience is out there? What, what can I see what, what would happen if I put out a game? Um, my goal was, well, sorry, my audience was to focus on uh, something family friendly. And I started questioning what, whether making a full version of this made sense. Uh, I was already putting work into this and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna go in a different direction because uh, I don't think this is, I want it to be more of an educational game. So that eventually became Toidle's Leaf Raking. I did eventually publish that. My goal was uh, to get it done by April 2nd. I actually got it out in October 2nd, 2016. So actually we just had an anniversary recently. Um, the, uh, the game's out on Android and iOS. And this roadmap that I created is laughable because that's, that is not what happened. But the, uh, the focus here was kind of making it more like a, a, a product, like what was I making? And I tried to focus on that. At the day job, a uh, similar example of like things going wrong. We had a, a list of 10 features to deliver and we had only so many months to do it. And we asked the product owner, what priority do you have for this? And the response we got back was not great. It was basically like, I don't care what you do so long as it all gets done. Um, you know, we were trying to be agile and I think we were a bit naive about how we were asking about it in hindsight, but um, this was not great in terms of actually being agile. Um, this was not thinking in terms of the product. This was thinking about the project. We had these features, they all had to get done and that was that. Um, 
And this is the difference between the two. When you think about things from a point of view of a project, you've got a focus on your output. Um, your, you've got so many hours, you've got so many people, you've got so much money you're spending, uh, you have a fixed schedule, there's a deadline, um, you have your scope that cannot budge, cannot change. And I like this quote that I found, I'm trying to remember which website I found it on related to project versus product, but it was uh, the idea that you could do everything right, get it on time, get it in scope, uh, but still end up with a dud for a product that you try to sell to customers who don't care. You can still build the wrong thing. Uh, operations a success, but the patient died. And there's no real ownership of this because a project is just kind of a short-term thing and you don't really have room to, to course correct. Whereas with a product, you're focused more on your customer and you can own a product. You can have teams that are dedicated to products. And so there might be short-term projects related to that product, but there is kind of a longer term idea of who we are trying to serve. Uh, again, if you go back to that quality definition, the value is defined by the customer. And as you learn more about what the customer actually wants, the scope that you had might change. You might decide, oh, we came up with all these features and they don't care about that at all. They want something else entirely. And you can fix that. Um, and so that's the difference between the two. So have a product focus when you're working on your game development project. Um, I know I just said project, but have a product focus. Uh, and the key to that is know knowing who your customers are. Are you making games like, are you making a, a horror themed game, then you're clearly not making something family friendly. And so you shouldn't try to appeal to uh, parents who are looking for something to help uh, their kids learn something. Um, understand that planning is a great activity. It gives you a lot of insight, but your plan itself can change. Uh, again, your scope might change as you learn things. And uh, another key thing is this idea that when you do come up with a plan, you've guessed at what might work. Uh, when you go in front of customers, you deliver something to them and say, what do you think? And you find out what they actually think, you might find out that what you delivered isn't itself useful. So if we go back to that idea of the fixed scope, I mean, you can keep building the thing that's wrong, but that's a waste of money. And you know, use that feedback to change what you're working on. Uh, you're guessing at the feature and it's okay to say these features aren't gonna work or even lop off the feature after you've implemented it if it's actually hurting the, the product. Uh, another key thing, especially when you talk about uh, agile software development is iterative and incremental development. Uh, my own personal example with Toidal's leaf raking, uh, the game has a weather system in it. And in order to experiment to see what it felt like, I actually created a text-based prototype of the game, which is basically the same game as the GUI version, but it was, it was me trying to figure out how quickly can I figure out like what should be in a menu, what feels right. And so I just created this very short program to, to display text. And I said, let me see if I can view a weather report. And then I eventually threw in kind of a weather system there. And I learned a lot, right? And this is a small amount of code. I don't remember how long it took me to write this, but not very long. And that learning was valuable. Fast forward, eventually it became a core feature of the game. And I had rain, I had wind, I had uh, cloudy weather, I had sunny weather, uh, I had storms. Um, I had a weather forecast that you can look at. Uh, and all these things kind of all came together. It was uh, all based off of what I learned from that very small thing. Um, at the day job, I can tell you when we worked on the village people party, uh, we had months before that prototype date and no one was paying attention to me. And so I kind of didn't know what to work on exactly, but I was slowly getting things together and showing some people what I had worked on when they asked, but no, almost no one ever did. Um, and then right before we were going to go to prototype where they actually take the game, go to Vegas, find a hotel room, pull people in to say, what do you think of this game? Um, suddenly everyone's paying attention. And it's like, why aren't all these things done? We're, we need to get all these things done now. And that was a lot. That was a lot of, especially for me as a new person, uh, my understanding for this game was a very in, intense game for a new person, I was told multiple times, because there was a lot of content in it. But the, uh, 
the main thing was like all of this work had to suddenly happen at once. And I just remember being stressed because I needed to work on one thing at a time just because that's physics. And I didn't know who I should worry about. Was it the game designer who needed to see certain game uh, bonus games in there? Was it the mathematician who needed to make sure that the math was working correctly as he designed it? Uh, was it the, the quality assurance people who had defects that they were telling me about? Uh, there was people who wanted a math simulation in order to, to test that math on, on the QA side. I didn't know what to work on first. Uh, and I luckily had a tech lead who told me what, what to focus on, but I didn't have that experience myself and I was freaking out for a while. Um, so by the time I actually had a game put together, the we did a code review at the end, uh, which is awful. And it was in the entire code base. And by that point, it was also really late to incorporate feedback. I learned a lot about what I could have done to make my job easier in that code review, but it really didn't help this project. Um, the designer didn't really get to say, like, you know what, this doesn't work. I want to change this. Like, there was no, no time for that. And then the testers, especially, there's the idea that the game runs late and then the QA has to do all of their you know, months of testing in two weeks before, because there's a deadline for release. And so everything just kind of cascaded and it was a terrible experience. And so you can understand why people were saying, hey, you're a poor performer. So the main lesson to take from this for me uh, is that game design and software development are both iterative and incremental. Uh, the idea behind being iterative is that you make something and then you look at it and figure out like, okay, can I take what I made and massage it and change it? Um, let me build a little bit more. Uh, incremental means that I've got something that's fully functioning, even if it's not, um, you know, publishable, I have something fully functioning. For instance, like my weather system, I was able to take that and, um, you know, the iterative part of that was that it was text-based and eventually I got it into the games in a, in a more formal, uh, finished form. Uh, but the incremental part was that I had that weather screen and I was able to show what the forecast was. And then later I was actually able to show on the screen whether it was raining or not, um, things like that. And being able to slowly build up the work that way, uh, having something finished and then being able to build on that is much better for productivity. So this is less of a skill or uh, something that I've learned a lot, a lot along those lines, but just uh, to, to remind everyone that crunch is very unhealthy. Uh, I'll talk again about my time at WMS. This was a company that had a uh, basically a converted warehouse and that's where we did our software development. They eventually moved into a different building and um, you know things were a lot brighter there, but it was dark. Uh, some programmers liked it in the dark they preferred it in the dark. They actually tried turning off overhead lights that were near them. Um, but I, especially when I was in Crunch for the Village People Party and multiple games at that company um, after that, I was in before the sun rose, especially in the winter, and I was out right after the sunset. So I basically never saw the sun. It was a miserable time. And the only sunlight I had was this emergency exit door that had a little tiny window in it. This is not the actual door that was there. It's just a picture I found on the internet, but uh, the point remains. When I was at John Deere, I remember we, had, we were part of a team that put in long hours to try to make a deadline and people were expressing their displeasure about this um, during a retro. Someone, I think our delivery lead found out about that uh, negative feedback and apparently I wasn't there for this but scolded the entire team saying they weren't committed um, you know as if we were children and uh, morale dropped it was not a fun time and it wasn't the only time I experienced crunch but that was one that was kind of memorable even though I wasn't there just because I heard about it afterwards from the team that was there in my opinion crunch is a um, is what you do when you don't know how to manage your project. And you know the idea is like, you set an arbitrary deadline, you have your fixed scope and it's not happening. So you just make people work more and they have to sacrifice their health. They have to sacrifice their family. Um, there's lots of stories of people who have gotten divorces and um, you know missed the birth of their children or missed their kids growing up. And this is not just in general software development, it's especially the case in game development. And 
you know, just this idea that everybody's lives are expendable so that you can get the shareholders happier is ridiculous. Uh, and yet we do this a lot. And I've done this, you know, I think even as recent as a few years ago, um, you know, even voluntarily, I still think if, if even if you do it voluntarily, it's still not healthy. Uh, I gave a presentation a, a couple years ago and found a number of these headlines. Uh, Cyberpunk 2077 was not out yet, and the you know they were all over the news. Um, it was, or at least the the general news that you know game developers would read, and uh, you know just crunch it was just terrible. Um, you know, people were, were like I said, I, I know one game developer who um, he ended up coming home and finding out that his wife left him. Uh, you know, they just, other people have died uh, because that's, it's actually, I mean, especially, I know this is a very clickbaity uh, looking headline here, um, but I mean, if you're, if you're crunching, you're probably not exercising or taking care of yourself in other ways. So you're probably sitting much longer. And we know there's a lot of news recently uh, in the last few years about how sitting for too long is actually, um, you know, gonna, it shortens your life. Uh, but there's a number of other things that, you know, people have gotten stressed, people don't get sleep. Uh, there's a number of, of things that make it unhealthy. So the IGDA used to have a quality of life special interest group. Uh, that group doesn't exist anymore, but they still, the resources that they produced are still out there. Um, so they have this uh, excellent short article about why crunch mode doesn't work. They have some lessons there. There's a number of other pieces that they have out. They've uh, written a, uh, arguing against what was happening for the uh, cyberpunk game. And um, today there's a number of other groups in, this, in the IGDA uh, along the lines of mental health or human resources or a number of others that uh, kind of talk about crunch a number of times, but uh, it isn't necessarily their main focus like quality of life was. Uh, in 2021, there's a developer satisfaction survey that the IGDA put together, and uh, it seems like some of these numbers are better. Um, it seems some people, or less people are reporting that their job included crunch. Um, at the same time though, it seems more people are reporting experiencing crush or crunch. So, you know, it seems kind of a mixed bag. Uh, and as I said, crunch is kind of this terrible um, way to run a project. Uh, so here's some ways to, you know, to, to run it differently is that you prioritize what you're working on. Uh, instead of just expecting everyone to get everything done, maybe if you find that the deadline is looming and you're not getting things done as fast as possible, maybe instead you cut your scope. Maybe you find a way to get the scope that you want in a more thin sliced way instead of uh, getting everything you want. You want to get feedback as fast, as fast as possible, whether that's in software development or in terms of your game design. Um, if you can, make something that's working and put it out in front of people. And you'll, you know, and, and basically the idea here is that you always, you always have something that's ready to go. So that if something does happen, if something slips, you at least have something that's finished and playable and possibly releasable at any given time. The focus on quality is especially, uh, we've already talked about that, but the idea here is that with crunch, people don't sleep, people work longer hours. After so many hours, they actually start making mistakes. And I, 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 there's statistics out there along the lines of, if you work on your, um, project and you push people to work more than uh, I forget if it was 60 hours or or some other number or even less than that um, the work that they end up doing is actually worse to the point where it will take like six weeks of 40 hour weeks to make that up in in terms of uh, fixing those issues so focus on quality and treat people like human beings instead of like cattle that you can push through the meat grinder the lesson here is you don't crunch. Uh, it's it's actually the way you introduce defects and make things slow down. Uh, you can't change if you find out that something doesn't work because you just don't really even have the cognitive ability. And we are game developers. We are working in a job that requires us to think. And when you crunch, you're purposely making yourself worse at that. Uh, it isn't healthy. healthy. 
you have um, the physical strain, you have the mental health issues, um, and you know, as I mentioned, it ruins people's lives, whether in terms of their social situation or even just killing them. Uh, most recently, IDOS Montreal announced that they're shifting to a four-day work week. Uh, they're not paying people less. So basically, they're considering this full-time for their employees. Uh, it's just that now they only work four, four days instead of five. Uh, and a lot of people have been getting excited about this. So I'm excited to, to hear how this experiment works. I think I've seen a few other people posting that they also do this at their own game companies. So I'm excited about this. Um, so with all that, I've talked about these four things that kind of came out from both games and software that I find go hand in hand together. Um, but there's plenty of others. I, I've got other examples of what I consider transferable skills that have helped me. Um, you know, for instance, in terms of game development, I was doing a lot of work in C++, which helped me land my first and second day job uh, because they were doing C++ and they needed someone who knew what they were doing. Um, I was familiar because I was working by myself. I had to do all the work myself. And so I was very familiar with the tools that I had to, to build that. I had uh, general software development experience, uh, software architecture. Uh, with later projects, I got better, really good at figuring out how to manage a project. And uh, running a business, I also needed to know, like, OK, so besides making the game, what's my product strategy? What am I doing in terms of you know, what kind of games am I making? Which ones am I going to green light myself? Um, you know, and then uh, all of the work I've done since I ran out of money and had to go back on corporate welfare has been kind of focused on like, OK, so where did I go wrong? And a big part of that was just not knowing how to run a business. So I got really into business strategy. And uh, there's a lot of dysfunction between the business and IT sides in a lot of companies. And that's actually a passion area of mine is to try to resolve that uh, dysfunction. And there's obviously a lot of leadership skills that come out of um, running your own business, even if you're leading yourself. So to come back with Jason Alba, uh, you know, the idea here is that with transferable skills, you get the experience you need uh, and you make sure you know how to talk about those experiences, especially when you can compare it to say like, okay, you want this uh, skill set, I can tell you how I've done things and uh, tell that story that how it applies to you. Uh, the, I will say this, this is my story. Uh, it's kind of worked, worked for me. I understand that there's a lot of privilege that goes into this because some people, um, if they were in my situation, maybe they don't work a job that's directly transferable to their game development. And it's actually very cognitively challenging to work on both. Um, there's a lot of energy that it takes to basically work two jobs, uh, one full-time and one part-time, even if it's your own hours, especially if it's your own hours, because it's only you that's holding you there. Uh, but I did find for, for me that my skills in indie game development did transfer uh, to, to help me improve my skills at my day job and vice versa. There was a lot of overlap between the two, uh, especially at my first few jobs. Uh, less so at my current uh, role, mainly because I still work in C++ on my indie game development business. But at my day job now, I, I rarely ever touch C++. Uh, the only downside for my own personal experience is that my day job is still my primary source of income. If you remember the numbers I showed earlier, I've uh, had I've been back on corporate welfare for almost a decade, and that's a little depressing to me because it's taken a very long time to get myself to a point where I can be full-time indie again, and I'm worried about how long that might be still. Uh, this was me actually looking at my finances recently. And um, this was a little depressing to see that my bank was just like, hey, look how much money you didn't make. Uh, so that was, that was not fun that Saturday. But I will say that with my experience with the tools and languages and the people I've met and just how I've, I've been able to practice the craft, practice consulting, um, I was able to leverage all of that and create and publish my own games. Uh, this example here, Continent Race uh, World Puzzle, 
is actually a game for a family in Chicago. I was introduced by somebody at my first day job. Um, he reached out and said, I know you're into game development and they, they want to make a mobile game. And can you talk to them? And I said, sure. So I, I never met them, never talked to them on the phone. It was all through email. They explained what they wanted. They want to make, um, the, the, they wanted to make a geography game for their kid. And it was basically, it sounded to me like a vanity project, but the, if you're familiar with some of the, uh, kids toy lines where there's like usually one kid's face, um, like someone's world or something like that. They basically wanted to do that. Uh, and they've actually done that. They've, they've, they've pushed real hard. They have a board game, which is uh, behind me <laughs> somewhere on my shelf uh, as a trophy for myself. But the, uh, I made this, I, I basically wrote the code, integrated all the art. I ended up reworking the design with them um, for the mobile app and then eventually got it out on iOS and Android for them. Uh, and the whole time they were paying me. So I was getting paid to make a game um, on the side, separate from my day job. And that's, I mean, that $0 that I made in my business, that's because I'm not currently selling anything and I'm not currently working for anybody uh, uh, for to earn anything. But for a while, it was kind of nice getting regular paychecks every, um, every two weeks. I basically delivered something to them and said, you know what, if you're good, we can keep moving. And if you want, we can publish this now. And they just kept going for much longer than I would have liked. <laughs> um, it took me a while to get back to my own projects, but everything, like I said, everything I did with, with at my day job really helped me to plan the project, work with this uh, client, communicate with them. And again, never talk to them on the phone or in person. It was all through email and somehow we made it work. And, um, and that's just one example. I have my own game development projects that I'm currently working on uh, and, and other plans. And again, all of those are transferable. Um, so at that point, I'll leave it up. I know we have maybe a few minutes um, if there's any questions at this time. Yeah, thank you very much for that presentation. I think one of the um, one of the big things to kind of hone on it, you know, is uh, getting back to that crunch time and making sure that you uh, you definitely don't don't overdo yourself. So I appreciate you bringing that up and uh, making the points that you did. We do have one question on here and it really does get into um, how do you, if you can, uh, balance working a day job and working on personal game projects? Yeah, that's been a balancing act that I've been trying to perfect <laughs> for years. Um, part of the challenge is that, uh, I'll, I'll say this, when I was originally doing this balance, it was just me. Uh, and maybe I had a girlfriend, um, you know, who I saw periodically, but, you know, it was a lot easier when it was like, I did the math once and it was like, here's my day job hours. You know, if I, if I do a 40 hour week, uh, that leaves me with, you know, if I, if I count shower time, uh, potty breaks, uh, you know, just, sleeping so many hours uh, in a day, I calculated that I had about four hours a day that I could be working on game development or at least my game development business. And um, this was a lot easier when my jobs were also cognitively easier. I was an intern at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, I think, when I, when I made this kind of calculation and I was talking to my uh, co-intern about that. Um, and so part of this was me getting up early. Uh, I became an early riser. Again, part of that was inspired by Steve Pavlina. Uh, getting up early was different from getting, you know, staying up late because uh, when I get up early, it's like, well, I want to get up. I'm fine with waking up with the sun. I like waking up even earlier than that. Um, I want to be able to use my best hours, which are my morning hours, on my thing. And so you know, when my first day job was, you know, it was essentially a, a, a game company that turned into a slot machine gambling company. Um, they still had kind of the same culture as a gaming company. They, like, it wasn't uncommon to see people come in at various hours, but uh, I would roll in 9, 10 a.m. because my morning was spent working on my own thing. I would write in my blog, I would do game development, uh, and then show up to work. I'd get home six or seven or so, 
Um, and then, you know, what was I going to do? I wasn't watching a lot of TV. I, I sometimes did more work then. Problem was crunch. <laughs> crunch kind of killed me on that because uh, it was just all I could do to just get to work and then do the work. And then the next thing I knew, I hadn't done any game development for a long time. Uh, today, I am married. We have two kids. Uh, what I learned a long time ago on my blog, I once wrote, like, if you, even if you only get 15 minutes of work done in a day, that's better than nothing. So do that. And someone commented saying, uh, that's great, but when you have kids, that's hard. And I didn't really appreciate that until I had my own kids. Uh, when a 20 minute task takes an hour because you're periodically checking on why your kids are crying or uh, something like that, it's things take longer and, um, you know, that's tough. I will say that what I do is I try to make sure I prioritize uh, my game development as much as I can. Um, at the same time, as much as I can isn't as much as I would like. So on average these days, I'm doing a little over five hours a week of game development, and it's a pretty consistent thing. Um, you can think of it along the lines of, uh, if I can do one hour a day during the week, that's fine. Uh, if I can get more in, that's great. Uh, I also have to be mindful of, you know, I've got a family, we've got other obligations. Um, kids have soccer practice, or my son's currently at Pokemon and my wife's taking him, and normally that's my job. Um, now there's a Pokemon gang at Mayhem, but anyway, the, uh, the, the, the struggle I will say is that as I'm getting older, I'm finding it is harder. It is, it, it can take a toll in terms of just how much time I dedicate to work is what essentially it is because I'm not just counting my day job anymore. I've, I've also given myself extra work on top of that. And that's not, easy for everyone. Uh, I know some people who are fine with working 60 hour weeks and they're, they're fine for some reason. And others who the 40 hour week itself has already killed any motivation to do anything and it's hard. Um, so I'm not gonna say, hey, just do what I do because I know that's not possible for everyone. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm doing something awesome because I'm amazing, but it's, it's something that, uh, kind of works for me. And I say kind of because, again, I would love to have more time to get things done. When I'm making a game and it takes me months when if I was working on it full time or on a weekend, I'd get it done in moments, uh, it feels like. It, it, that's that's kind of demoralizing to think about. So I try not to. <laughs> um, so I hope that answered your question, uh, except I, you know, I know that's kind of like along the lines of what I was told with how to get better at programming is just do it. That's not a very satisfying answer, um, but I hope it it's an answer. No, that was great. Um, definitely appreciate this conversation today. Definitely appreciate everything. We're running up on the seven o'clock hour. Uh, if there are any other questions, please uh, post them uh, and see if we can get those answered. If you don't have any questions or you don't want to get them answered right now, uh, feel free to go to our Slack or Discord. Um, I believe your handle on there is uh, GB Games. Yes. So um, any other uh, final thoughts that you'd like to throw out there? Yeah, I think, you know, again, uh, this is primarily for, for people in my boat. Uh, you know, if you want to be a full-time indie game developer and it's uh, tough because you're not yet and you have a day job, uh, I think making the most out of it as you can, uh, find out what those transferable skills are and see if you can dive into it more. Uh, in my case, I loved getting into how projects are managed. So even though I'm a uh, end of the line, someone tells me what to code and I do it. Uh, I like asking why and getting insight behind the scenes because um, I can then compare it to what I'm doing myself which helps me with my business. And uh, my goal ultimately is that eventually I am just doing my own business and not worrying about trying to balance my hours between a day job. Awesome, thank you very much. Well, I don't see any other questions coming through. I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for giving the presentation, uh, sharing your story. Uh, it was It was awesome, so. Uh, again, hop on Slack, hop on Discord, uh, 
ask questions if you do have them. But otherwise, we will see everybody next month for the uh, November. Remember, uh, third Thursday of every month. Um, we'll see you then. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone.